this month we've been exploring our annual theme of living everyday wonder through the topic of home. And um, which is a really good topic coming right into this holiday season here. And you know, most of the, a lot of times for us this, this time of year, we are posed with thoughts and or opportunities to return home for the holidays. Sometimes home is a place that can break us, leaving us feeling the sting of lifelong wounds that have been difficult to heal. And so this week, uh, we're also, uh, through the series, we're also looking at um, the hero or heroine's journey and some of the work that of Joseph Campbell and Carl Jung and um, some other folks who have been able to um, use the power of archetype to help us understand ourselves a little bit better. Um, so we know that there's uh, some stages in, in the hero's journey and today we're going to take a little bit, circle back around and take a little bit more of a look through the stage of initiation. Um, I think most people would probably have it within them to be able to describe the elements of a happy, healthy home, but there are far fewer who would say or could say that they grew up in their ideal home. You may be wondering why we're even talking about this. Well, that's the beauty of our Center for Spiritual Living. We are willing to talk about things that nobody else will. You will hear things on a Sunday morning and in other, other our gatherings that um, you're not going to hear very many other places. Maybe on some of the self-help talk shows. So, we're willing to talk about elephants in the living room. Not to make people sad or depressed or fearful or even worried, but to help shed some light and some understanding on what it is or has been so that we can do what's next so that we can heal, so that we can know also that we're not alone. Hiding, ignoring, shrieking, and sneaking away from our dragons <laughs> only uh, is temporary. It's avoidance. Why we talk about it is so that we can also talk about the other stuff, spiritual tools that help us to do that deeper inner work that is juicy, it's messy, confusing, and often painful as we engage on our hero or our, our heroine's journey. Here's another thing. We hold that everything is sacred and there's nothing too sacred to talk about. You see, our progress, our evolution, our transformation is way too important to be left under the rug. Our lives and our living are too cherished to leave in a stagnant state of undiscovered and unhealed wounds and fear. We have the guts, the heart, the wisdom, and the tools to take this on. So unhealed childhood pain and trauma, as we know, can result in adverse effects in virtually every area of our life. There are some who will continue to walk around as victims in this life, and there are others who have taken it on and brought to themselves an understanding that being victimized doesn't make a, make a victim. Our traumas need not define us. We are in charge of defining ourselves and the role that we assign or the power that we give to trauma as it occurs for us or has occurred for us in our lives. So I want to use HOME as an acronym, H-O-M-E. Healing, H. Opportunities, O. Manifest, M. E. 
everywhere. The task of facing our own inner dragons is part of the hero's initiation and it's really necessary for our own growth and transformation that ultimately results in our spiritual and psychological maturity. Now, Artist Holmes offers this in, in trying to come to terms with some of the questions that arise as part of this journey. He says this, he says, there is a question, however, which naturally arises. Why all the suffering, sorrow, and pain? Why has tragedy accompanied the journey of man? Again, our imaginary, our imagination may answer this question in a somewhat plausible manner, just this, there is no other way through which true individuality can evolve. Man must be left alone to discover himself or else be compelled arbitrarily to follow one road, in which case he would be an automaton and not an individual. So a pain-free existence is probably not reality, but how we respond to that as opposed to reacting to it, that is in our power. That is in our purview of choice. You see, everything that we need for this evolution, for this journey, already exists within inside of us, and it's all around us. We already have all that we need. So when we live in faith, that life is conspiring for us on our behalf. Life does this neat thing. It's called reciprocates. It reciprocates by leading us to the resources, the people, the places needed to bring about our highest and best outcomes. The faith that everything is happening for our greater good and that we all need to prevail develops something that we know about. It's called resilience that allows us to thrive in the face of any adversity or challenge that we might come up with. So this talk about the hero's journey is that as a journey about awakening to the truth of ourselves, as well as learning the tools and techniques and strategies to enjoy the fullness of that truth, including compassion and forgiveness. As we enter into this beloved and sacred time of year, I think along with all the other dishes that are getting served up, we could use a healthy serving of compassion and forgiveness. Now, this discussion isn't meant to be a downer or depressing, but I don't think we're going to be helping anybody um, on the road to healing if we only talk about the warm and fuzzy aspects of home. We come to recognize as a part of our teaching that healing opportunities show up all the time everywhere. So as we're traveling our own individual journey, we encounter trials and tribulations that actually are opportunities for our own learning and growth. And if we allow ourselves then to be defined by challenges as being a victim, we find ourselves potentially being stuck in kind of painful and recurring situations. But we do have available to us the opportunity to choose to face the dragons on our hero's journey. And when we do, that inner guidance, our spirit, responds magnificently for us. Being a light in the dark, providing us with all the ideas, the resources, people, places, and experiences needed for our transformation. Now admittedly, for a lot of folks, family gatherings can be a time of relaxation and renewal as we come together with family and friends with the expectations of shared love and laughter and lots of home-cooked favorites. I am really aware though that this time of year 
for a lot of folks can be the exact opposite of that. It's a time of a lot of anxiety, trepidation, maybe sadness or shame, maybe even anger, visiting the home can remind us of people that have passed on or be triggers for childhood trauma. It might even be toxic for some folks. Because home is where the heart is, it's often a place where we find bruised and broken. It's often a place that has a lot of emotional charge. And so we need to have an awareness of how it could go and come equipped with tools and strategies armored with love and compassion. I would submit, offer this to you. Something as simple as a shift, just a little shift. Try responding instead of reacting. Redirect the energy that's around you. Imagine if we could do that, how much power and freedom our perception about home as a place of healing would unfold. Changing a question from, what's wrong with you? To, what happened to you? You see how different that feels? It feels more inviting, safer. It's more of a place then to get it out in the open and offers the opportunity for compassionate listening. In those moments, we can replace judgment with compassion, with understanding and with love. Those are divine gifts that will sustain us through any challenge. Something that simple will take the dynamite out of any potentially explosive situation. In any room or experience, this is how you and I make a difference. We make it safer for ourselves and for others. We also understand too, while we're talking about healing, that healing doesn't always mean that a condition automatically disappears. However, because we are shifting our consciousness, it is change because we change. Think of your own work. I just go back in your mind to what once was or who you once were, to who you are now. In that work, we have embraced and have a greater understanding about fear. Where once there was huge resistance and animosity, there is now an opening to understanding. To understanding fear as a tool and an invitation to wake up as a pathway for our own growth and unfoldment. Now you might be say, asking, Maggie, why, why are we talking about this so much? Why is it so important? Well, I want you to consider this as a as results of a study that was done in 1995 by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and um, Kaiser Permanente. They did a joint study um, about something called adverse childhood experience. You might have heard it referred to as ACEs. That study revealed what many consider to be the number one health risk prior to COVID-19. In that study, they identified ACEs as divided into three categories of abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. And each experience of recollection or memory counted as a point, and the maximum score is 10. Now, what they found out of that study is only a third of the population has a score of zero. They were at, the researchers were looking for a direct link between childhood trauma, obesity, mental illness, incarceration, workplace issues, anger management, um, and the onside, onset of many chronic diseases. 
we're all intelligent here. It doesn't take rocket scientists to figure out the more aces you have, the more pain and suffering has been in your life experience. As we look out into what is happening in our world, we can see that juvenile detention centers or jails or prisons our counseling centers and mental health um, treatment centers and drug addiction recovery centers are full of people who have a lot of ACEs. It's been said that one of, when one of the original researchers of this project stood back and he took a, a look at all of what they were finding in this study, he was brought to tears and wept as he saw how much people were suffering and had suffered. He couldn't not because he's a very compassionate person. So in the 25 or 30 years that have lapsed since that study, researchers have identified something else too, which is called protective resilience factors that allow children and families to move through challenging circumstances and come out the other side stronger, more resilient, better able to cope, manage, thrive, instead of just surviving. The biggest factor they found in managing and navigating life's challenges is the strength and the quality of our social and familial connections. Remember we started out this month with Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz and, uh, amongst a number of other um, archetypical hero or heroine's journey stories. Well, she made it back home to Kansas. She didn't do it all by herself. She had a lot of support from her friends, namely the wizard and the tin man and the lion and the scarecrow and Glinda the Good Witch. <laughs> Now the next uh, contributing factor besides connections is faith. Faith. Those who have overcome obstacles in their lives invested in faith. The faith that they live in a friendly universe. Faith in their capacity to prevail over challenging circumstances and faith that there's a greater good available. The hero emerges when the individual uses his or her inherent power to overcome their great challenge and then uses that newly found perspective and understanding to serve a cause greater than themselves. Carl Jung coined the term wounded healer. How many have ever heard that before? Um, he used that term to describe the archetype of those who transcend hardship and suffering and use their wisdom and understanding to facilitate the healing of others. In other words, to be in service. And it, and it isn't just physical injury, it could be psychological and emotional too. You may recognize famous wounded healers in contemporary terms. Who is out there that we use as role models? Oprah Winfrey? Uh, Malala Yousafzai? Who else? But even if they aren't great names of, noted, of the noted celebrity kind, take a look around you, a little closer to home. They also come in the guise of our social worker, the brother who died from an overdose, the AA sponsor, the asthmatic child who becomes a nurse or the domestic violence survivor, who raises money for a women's shelter, and run support groups. 
we are surrounded by angels. See, all of these people rose up from the adversity of their life challenge, rose up from the scepter of their lurking dragons to become agents of transformation and of healing um, and inviters to create awareness. No one escapes challenges in life. We have them all the time. But it's how we choose to handle those challenges that defines who we are and who we're becoming and determines what trajectory our path is going to take. It's through our personal wounds that we gain access to the inner strength that empowers, heals, and ultimately blesses. And knowing this and feeling it allows us to give thanks in all circumstances for all things. Know too how blessed we are to be in spiritual community, that this is a safe place to be who we are. I want to share with you a story that really, in a rather humorous and ironic way, um, speaks to what I've been sharing this morning. So there was a farmer and one day his horse ran away. And the farmer's neighbor comes over and commiserates with him. He says, I am so sorry for your horse and your loss. The farmer says, good, bad, who knows? The neighbor is really confused because it's abundantly clear that this is a terrible event. For the horse was the farmer's most valued possession. Well, incredibly, the horse returned the next day, accompanied by 12 feral horses. And after witnessing that extraordinary event, the neighbor returns to celebrate, exclaiming, Congratulations on your great fortune! Again, the farmer replies, Good, bad, who knows? The neighbor is, again, really confused, because this is clearly a wonderful event. Well, the next day, the farmer's son broke his leg when he was thrown from one of the wild horses he was trying to tame. That neighbor, who clearly has nothing better to do, came over lamenting, I am so sorry about your son. It's a terrible turn of events. The farmer, staying true to himself, replies, good, bad, who knows? The neighbor really is dumbfounded now and doesn't understand this very strange neighbor of his. Anyone could see how awful it was, and sure enough, the next day, the army marched through their village, conscripting able-bodied young men to go fight in a war. The farmer's son was spared because of his broken leg. Good? Bad? Who knows? You know, we can add to that story, <laughs> add in the night of, what's the point? You see, it is our dualistic perspective and our tendency to be in judgment, good, bad, who knows. It's a false dichotomy. All things, all things work for our good, if we choose, if we're aware, if we're willing to allow for that narrative in our life. So. Are you ready to continue on your journey? Are you ready to look at the working dragons? Come in your armor. Be prepared to listen if you're willing to ask. How about some of these questions? Scroll back in time and look for some of the early defining moments of your life. See if you can find some gems. What did you learn? What has served you on your journey so far? How might shifting a question such as, what's wrong with you, to what happened to you, change about how you look about yourself and about other people? 
And then how have your social connections or your family connections helped you move through the initiation phase and the more difficult parts of your life? And then maybe also reflecting if there's someone in your realm, in, in your life right now, who's in the midst of a difficult life transition, how can you be in service with them? How can you lend your understanding, your wisdom, and your skills to assist that person on their journey? Help them get unstuck. Help them to vanquish their fear. So that's your assignment for this week. Affirm with me now. I am grateful. I am grateful for all of my journey. For all of my journey. And so it is. And so it is.